Hey, I'm Felissa Rose, and you're watching Cato and Crime. 14th, 1929. A day that would live in infamy as one of the bloodiest in mob history. Seven men gunned down in Chicago. The rise of a criminal empire and the fall of another. Welcome to Thought Crime and Keto and Crime. Welcome to our analysis of the St. Valentine's Day party. Uh, in this video, we're going to be exploring both the North Side and South Side gangs of Chicago and get into the actual party itself. So without further ado, let's get going. The North Side Gang, otherwise known as the Irish Gang of Chicago, though it encompassed a lot of different nationalities, not just Irish. Though the one that is more associated with the St. Valentine's Day uh, occurrence is of Irish descent. However, this was a very eclectic, very cosmopolitan gang. It had members from all nationalities in it. It, but it is historically referred to as the Irish Gang of Chicago. Uh, started originally by Dean O'Bannon. Now, Dean O'Bannon was, a, he also went by Dion. He's also referred to as Dion, though he absolutely never actually went by that first name, but some people refer to him as Dion O'Bannon. But he started as a paper boy in Chicago during the circulation wars. Now, if you've ever seen the Walt Disney movie Newsies, that's a very dr dramatized version of it. But basically, there were two major newspapers in the Chicago area in the early, late 18th century, early, not, late 19th century, early 20th century, excuse me. The Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Examiners. And there were literally turf wars between the paper delivery boys from these two newspapers. They fought in the streets. That's what Newsies is all about. They fought in the streets. And these weren't just young boys like portrayed in that movie. That's my cigar. You'll steal another. Hey, hey bummers, we got work to do. Since when did you become me, mother? I stop ya bawling. Who asked you? These were grown men that this was their job. And they literally fought turf wars over circulation of these two newspapers. Later, these two newspapers would combine into just the Chicago Tribune. But for the early part of the 20th century, they were at war. Dean O'Bannon got a reputation for being an enforcer for uh, his newspaper of choice, which kind of flip-flopped back and forth. He didn't really pick a side, whichever one paid him the most is the one that he would enforce. And he had a reputation for getting the other paper people out of his territory. That's how he got his start. He also started dealing with Charlie the Ox Reasoner, who was a big safe cracker. Like, when you rob banks, when you rob stores, he could crack the safes. So, he started hanging out with Dean O'Bannon, and they started doing petty theft and small-time burglary around the neighborhood. And then eventually, from street enforcer, like they turned from the circulation wars to just enforcing their own territory, exclusively on the north side of Chicago. And incidentally, I have, what really surprised me is I spend a lot of time in Chicago for comedy. My wife's family is from the north side of Chicago. My best friend in the world is a DJ and lives on the north side of Chicago. Just blocks from where a lot of this happened. So I actually took a gangster's tour of Chicago the last time I was there. So I got to actually see a lot of these places. If you're ever in Chicago, take that tour. It's, it's amazingly educational. But back to the story. So they started enforcing their own turf in Chicago with a protection racket, which means you pay us, we'll make sure nothing happens to your business. And if they didn't pay, they got burgled by them. So 
they had that kind of racket going on. And then they eventually, with the onset of Prohibition, when all alcohol was outlawed in the United States for a brief time, they started bootlegging. Now, they did never got into, as far as we know, prostitution, which their rival Southside gang would be very heavily into. But they mainly stuck to protection racket, which is getting people to pay them not to burgle or destroy their property. Actually, destruction and theft from the businesses that didn't pay them. And selling bootleg alcohol, wine, and beer to many of the speakeasies around town, which a speakeasy is a secret room in the behind of a public establishment where you have to know a password and you can get in and have alcohol, which was outlawed at the time. They took over all of the existing breweries and distilleries on the north side of Chicago, shut them down officially, but then used them to turn out illegal moonshine. They also were one of the first gangs to actually start election fraud. They would rig elections, uh, put pressure on people to vote for their candidates, steal ballots, all kinds of stuff you see political parties doing today. Uh, and they would have politicians in their pockets as well as police officers in their pockets. So they were allowed to continue their criminal enterprise all over the north side of Chicago. Now if you don't know the di difference of Chicago, Basically, look at a map, divide it right down the middle, where you've got um, Cicero and the south side here, and you've got Clark Street, State Street, north side here. North side encompasses most of the little wood, like Lakewood, those areas of Chicago, as going on out to Rosemont, as well as the downtown area. And then you get into the more south side area, and that's where it kind of divides. They also developed a reputation during O'Bannon's time of doing a lot of charity on the north side. They opened soup kitchens, gave jobs, gave money, uh, no interest loans to help people out. More of just keeping a good face in the neighborhood so that no one ratted them out more than actually uh, being a charitable bunch of people. So all means to an end. Uh, O'Bannon ruled the North Side gang with an iron fist, though unlike his South Side contemporaries, he did have a cohort, an entourage that he shared power with in the North Side, and they kind of did it very, very well. It worked very well for them. O'Bannon was, of course, of Irish descent, which I think because he actually helped start the gang, that's where we get the idea that it's the Irish gang of Chicago but let's move on. For those of you watching on video, here to my left you see photos of the big four, the four gunmen as they were called, of the North Side. These were the ones that ruled the North Side gang. You had Dean O'Bannon, the original, pictured here to the right. You had Bugs Moran, who will become more important as we get closer to the actual St. Valentine's Day festivities, pictured here. You had Vincent Drucci, pictured here, and finally Jaime Weiss, pictured down here. Now Jaime Weiss is noted as the only man that Al Capone of the Southside Gang ever admitted he was frightened of. Uh, Jaime was of Polish descent, and he, Vincent, who was one of the Italian members of this gang, and Bugs, who was also Irish, ruled after Dean O'Bannon was murdered in 1925. They operated out of North Clark Street, actually where my friend lives on North Clark, uh, just down from where my friend lives on North Clark Street, out of a bar and grill, and also frequented Schofield Flowers on State Street, in front of one of the largest cathedrals in Chicago. In fact, it was the Northside Gang and Dean O'Bannon that actually had a an ownership interest in that flower shop and made it the flower shop to the mob. Schofield Flowers provided the wreaths and flowers for all mob funerals in Chicago, both north side and south side. They even provided the wreaths for the men killed during the St. Valentine's Day party. So, yeah. Dean O'Bannon was in the flower shop uh, when a spring day in 1925 arranging for the funeral of a cohort of his. 
when men entered with Tommy guns and shot him dead. You just, just look at the flowers, Lizzie. After his death, the other three, the three remaining four gunmen, took over, and you had Jaime Weiss, Vincent Drucci, and Bugs Moran taking over the Northside gang. And all along this time, a continued feud with the Southside gang because you had the Southside gang coming in trying to take over the Northside operation and vice versa. So before the Southside gang's emergent, the Northside gang kind of took care of all of Chicago. Then when Capone came in, which we're going to talk about him in a minute, he basically divided Chicago and then there was a turf, turf war to kind of control all of Chicago. So that's what it was. Um, Jaime Weiss was the next of the four gunmen to die. He was again walking across the street from Schofield Flowers toward the big cathedral. Holy Name Cathedral, one of the largest uh, Roman Catholic cathedrals in all of Chicago. He was leaving Schofield Flowers, crossing over to attend uh, a ceremony at the cathedral, which is right across the street. And he was gunned down from unseen gunmen along the buildings on State Street. He was actually mowed down right in front of the cathedral. In fact, during the tour I took, you can actually get out of the bus. We couldn't that day because there was a wedding going on, but if under normal circumstances, they would have stopped the bus and allowed us to go up to the cathedral. There's actually bullet holes that have been preserved from the day Jaime Weiss was murdered. And you can actually like put your fingers in it. And I went back later and did that. I wish I had taken a picture so I could show you guys, but so he was gunned down in the middle of the street. This was during the height of the rivalry between the North Side and South Side gang. There was a trial going on because of the murder of a Capone associate at the time. So they believe that Jaime's murder was a result of revenge for that Capone ally killing. As I said, uh, Jaime Weiss was of Polish descent. He was the only man that Al Capone ever admitted to being frightened of. Then you had Vincent Drucci, who was actually arrested by Chicago police in 1927 and was shot dead in the car, handcuffed by a Chicago police officer. He was the only one of the entire four horsemen, or four horsemen, four gunmen that were actually killed by the police. Damn, that's some cold shit. Let's get into the Southside Gang, and no, these are not people that just root, root, root for the White Sox versus the Cubs, like the North Side and Southside Gangs of today, it's mainly Chicago Cubs versus White Sox, go Cubbies, that make up the North and Southside Gangs of today. But you had mainly a man by the name of Johnny Torrio, for those of you on video here at the lower left, started an enterprise in New York City working for a man named Paul Kelly. And they ran basically a bootlegging operation in New York and a prostitution and gambling ring. And eventually, with the help of a young bouncer named Alphonse Capone, Capone that worked for Torrio in one of his brothels, they decided to move their operation to Chicago. So they left New York City. Torrio moved to the south side of Chicago. They operated out of businesses along Cicero, which is one of the major uh, streets there on the south side. And immediately went to war with the north side gang. Um, as I said, they did bootle bootlegging and prostitution. They also had their own protection rackets going on on the south side. And they started to stake out a claim on some north side distilleries and breweries and customers. So there was an ongoing turf war. A lot of people got killed. A lot of businesses got destroyed because of this ongoing rivalry between Capone and the north side gang. Now, Capone was the de facto leader, even though Johnny Torrio kept a leadership interest for many, many years. Neither of these gentlemen were actually murdered in the gang wars as many of the members of the Northside gang were. They both actually went to jail for tax evasion. Both of them. Uh, Torrio was actually uh, arrested in 1935 once he got out. 
he kind of lived a quiet life in retirement and everything kind of transferred to Capone until he also went down for tax evasion and is serving in Alcatraz prison, actually. And then came out with um, the effects of a longtime case of syphilis, finally relegating him to the mentality of a 12-year-old. And eventually he died of his illness. But uh, both of these gentlemen were from Sicily, and so they had a huge bonding over their Italian ancestry. And the Southside Gang was uniquely an Italian gang. All of this came to a head. You had O'Bannon had been murdered by Southside Gang members. Then you had Jaime Weiss, and then Ricky killed, Vincent killed by police. So you had one gunman, one kingpin left on the north side, and that was Bugs Moran. Capone wanted to get rid of Moran because he knew once he killed him, the north side gang would be in shambles and would be in a huge amount of chaos and would allow his gang to take over all of Chicago. He also had a beef with Moran because Moran, as revenge for the deaths of two of his fellow gunman, as well as he believed Capone had something to do with the arrest of Vincent, decided he was going to go after Capone's interests in the city of Detroit. Within Detroit, there was what was known as the Purple Gang, and the Purple Gang was a Jewish-ran mob family that did bootlegging within the city of Detroit and sold much of what they made to Capone to distribute in Chicago. They were basically selling more than what Capone's own distilleries and breweries could produce, so they had to buy from this purple gang in Detroit to kind of stem the tide. So the North Side gang under Moran started hijacking those shipments, as well as trying to cut in on Capone's stake on those Detroit beverages and Capone didn't like it and decided he was going to deal with it and that came to a head February 14th, 1929. Bugs Moran and his compadres had gotten a leg up on a shipment of purple gang Capone whiskey that had been hijacked and they were told it had been taken to a garage at 2122 North Clark Street on the north side of Chicago for them to take a look at and take possession of. Bugs Moran was supposed to be there along with seven of his gang members. However, he woke up late and got a late start and when he got to the garage he saw a couple things he didn't like. Uh, this happened about 10.30 a.m. on Thursday, February 14, 1929, St. Valentine's Day, at a auto garage on North Clark Street. When he got there, he saw his men enter, but then he also saw four men dressed as police officers pull up outside. He also saw what he thought was a police car kind of milling around out back, and he got spooked. So Moran backed off and went down the street to a local restaurant, ducked in and ate breakfast to avoid being seen. He wanted to stay where he could see what was going on, but he didn't want to be arrested. He figured someone had called the cops on him, so he was just going to lay low. Meanwhile, seven of Bugs Moran's henchmen entered the building, four people dressed as police officers. They figured that Capone had bribed Chicago PD on the south side to give him four uniforms. And also, there was even speculation that the police knew about this and was allowing it to go on because they were angry that the Northside gang had actually shot a couple of police officers in a, a few weeks prior. So this could have been sort of a police revenge tactic as well by letting this go on. But yet seven Northside gang members enter the garage and then four people dressed as police officers enter behind them. And several people saw the police officers enter. It's important to remember that this was absolutely a hit on Bugs Moran. That's who they wanted. Anybody else there was just cannon fodder. And when they saw the men enter, they thought they saw Bugs Moran enter, even though he had seen the commotion and 
decided to sit this one out, but Albert Wycheck, who managed some of the Northside owned laundry businesses, and when I say laundry, I don't mean actual laundry business, though some of them actually were. I mean the businesses that sometimes gangs own to make legitimate money. So they run their illegal money from gambling and protection and um, bribery through a legitimate business to prove where their income comes from. So he actually managed some of these businesses for the Northside Gang and he was there that day and he had the same height, weight, eye color, everything as Bugs Moran. So a lot of people thought that the lookout saw him, thought it was Bugs Moran, and assumed that everything was in place. Well, you had these men enter. They were about to take a look at this whiskey. There was a truck there. But before they could, four men entered, dressed as police officers. They immediately told them this was a bust. They moved them up against the wall, had them face the wall, put their hands up. And they immediately thought they were about to be searched and then arrested, but they whipped, whipped out four Thompson machine guns, also known as Tommy guns, and the bullets flew. And all of them, except for Frank Gusenberg, was dead. The Gusenbergs were brothers that worked as enforcers for the Northside Gang. Then you had Albert Cachella, also known as James Clark. He was Moran's second-in-command, also his brother-in-law. You had Reinhardt Schwimmer, an optician who had become a one of the gambling aficionados, gambling captains of the gang. You had Albert Weinchek, as I said, who ran their legitimate businesses. And John May, who drove the car that day and occasionally repaired their vehicles. So he was just kind of there. But they were all shot down. And only Frank Gusenberg was alive. Um, they had actually also whipped out a couple of shotguns, uh, shot a few of them in the facial area to finish them off. Once that happened, after the hail of bullets was over and they assumed all of them were dead, two of the men dressed as police officers removed their uniforms, stashed them, then they put up their hands and allowed the other two men, still dressed as police officers, to take them out of the building with police-issued firearms and put them into the police cars so that it looked to passers-by that this was a police raid and these were just them taking two of the men they had seen go in there out. They got into their police cars and moved away. No one really thought about it. Later on, when the uh, crime scene was discovered, it became the biggest news of the day, as you can imagine. There have been so much, there's been so much in pop culture related to this one incident. Um, we'll cover a few of those. But let's just say that immediately Bugs Moran accused Capone. He said, only Capone kills this way. So, of course, there was a, an inquiry put out for Al Capone. He was asked to come and answer some questions at the police department a couple of days later. He said he was too sick to attend. And to this day, there has not been one shred of plausible evidence that could actually connect Capone to it legitimately, although everyone kind of knows he was responsible. Um, like I said, this has become a very romanticized event. Both of these gangs, the North Side and South Side gang, up until this very day, had kind of an anti-hero thing going on. They were criminals, yet they did a lot of charity for their respective sides of the city, so they were kind of held almost as heroes, but not quite. After this particular incident, that whole persona kind of cracked, and people started seeing the gangsters for what they really were. Gangsters, criminals, and murderers, and the whole, the whole attitude toward the North and South Side gang shifted with this one incident. This has also been one of the most heavily pop culture references of all of the gang wars. It has been the subject of so many movies. In fact, one of my favorite movies is Some Like It Hot with Marilyn, uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, Tim Curtis, and Jack Lemmon. Well, the massacre that they witness and have to go on the run from is technically the St. Valentine's Day incident, but can't really say that, so... That Hello, Charlie. Long time no see. What is it, Spats? 
What are you doing here? I just dropped in to pay my respects. You don't owe me no nothing. I wouldn't say that. You were nice enough to recommend my mortuary to some of your friends. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, now I got all those coffins on my hands. And I hate to see them go to waste. Well, Miss Spence, I had nothing to do with it. Oh, too bad, Charlie. You would have had three eights. Goodbye, Charlie. No, Spats, no! No, Spats, please, no, no! I think I'm gonna be sick. They call it something else, but so many movies have been based on this particular incident on the North Side and South Side gangs, all the way up into the most recent personification of Al Capone in the uh, HBO series Boardwalk Empire. So this is something that is kind of burned into the American psyche, the American story, but it, as its core, remains one of the most gruesome gangland killings of all time. As I said, of these seven men, only one was alive when they were actually found, and that was Frank Gusenberg. He lived about three hours after this and was able to answer a few questions in the hospital. You know what he said, being loyal to the gangland code to the end. He said no one shot him. Laying there riddled with bullets, face half shot off, no one shot him. I think that sums it up. I hope you've enjoyed this. I'm really grateful for all the people that watch, like, share, subscribe. Please, if you want to support the channel, i got links down below. Let me know what you thought of this video. Um, I'll be back soon with another true crime. Thank you so much. Keto comment.